All right, everybody, welcome. We are at the top of the hour and getting ready to get started here with Net DevOps Live. We are in season two, episode three, and joining me today is Big Evil Beard himself, Stuart Clark, and he's going to be talking to us a bit about how we can solve some of our operational challenges with network automation because network automation is good for more than just kind of pushing configs out. And so we're going to see and hear from the uh, Stuart on some of his ideas and experiences in this space as he actually helped use automation as part of operating one of Cisco's large data centers that powers one of our services. And I'm sure he'll mention a bit about that as we get going. As always, during today's webinar, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A panel. I'll be monitoring that throughout and handling them as they pop in. The question that usually comes up is, where can I get the slides? Is the session going to be recorded? Um, yes, the slides will be available, and the session is also being recorded and will be posted. I'll have them available hopefully tomorrow morning up on NetDevOps Live under the webinar resources session section for this webinar. Without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Stuart to take us into the content. Thanks, Stuart. Thank you, Hank, for that warm introduction. Hello, everyone. This is the Solving Operational Challenges with Network Automation. As Hank introduced me there, he mentioned that I work on one of Cisco's largest global footprints and doing projects on both operations. I did network operations for around 10 years before I moved to DevNet. And I started in the Tier 1, Tier 2, and then Tier 3 space, working my way through up there. And so I really understand how challenging it is when you're working in these kind of roles, any form of operational network role, of how you really don't know what you're going to be facing that day when you come into the office, when you pick up the phone, or when you see those tickets kind of come to flow in through the various support channels that we get. And throughout this session, we're going to look at some of those things, of the why we should do this, the how we should do this, and then we're going to close with a demo right toward the end. So let's move on to our agenda. Before we start today's session, I'd like you to complete the um, uh, some feedback for us, if you may, uh, by following the link. Hank will post this today in the, in the chat space. This will give us some great feedback and help us track the Net DevOps live interest and the sessions and the feedback and help us deliver the content to you. So what are we going to talk about? I've listed this in three different sections. I've listed it as who moved my cheese, rinse and repeat, and demo time. Who moved my cheese? You may think this is a kind of a strange uh, title for, for network operations, but I read this book around 1998, um, and it's a motivational business fable where there's uh, four characters to this, and they live in a, a maze. And it, it represents everyone's environment and the way that um, you look for cheese. And the cheese, in many ways, is your operational goals of what you see in your in your day to day. And it represents the happiness and success of how you're able to navigate through those things and achieve closing tickets, helping customer support here. And within that section, we have the learning services and getting context. When you start to automate some of your daily tasks and your daily work throughs in operations, you kind of have to look at that low hanging fruit to find out what it is you really want to automate. Then we look at the largest source of stress. This is again the sort of the stuff that kind of keeps coming around, it never really goes away, it kind of pops around, it might come around in your case every day. It might come around once a week or it might come around that Friday evening on a Friday when you've got something planned, it's the end of the month and something comes in and you know it's going to take you two or three hours to achieve that result to get that information. So it nicely moves us then into the next section which I've entitled Rinse and Repeat. Is twice too much? And what I mean by that is, if you're doing something manually twice, should you then automate it straight away? Now I've read many things about this, of how many times you should do it before you should automate it. And one thing that I read recently was, that if it took someone longer than 90 seconds to do manually, you should perhaps automate it. That might be a little aggressive for some, so I'd like you to ask yourself, how many times do I have to do things manually before I would actually consider automating that challenge? And then what we want to do is automate the boring stuff. I kind of spoke about this in the first little glimpse there where we was talking about the largest sorts of uh, sources of stress. But we want to automate those repetitive tasks again. That kind of, again, the low hanging fruit, the constant sort of requests. And we want to make this into a more of a self-service model, which enables others to be able to grab that information for you. 
And then we'll move into everybody's favorite part, which is the demo time and how to actually codify all of those things that we've spoke about in the above sections. This might seem like a little bit of a controversial slide and I'll read it out. How often do you find yourself doing a task so redundant and so dull that it feels like it might actually be making you dumber? Well, you don't like to really get above your station or we don't like to let ego in infringe on our daily jobs. We're there to do something. We're there to perform tasks. But going through those tasks, you could be logging into devices after devices after devices and it's repetitive. And while the first few times that while you're doing this and gleaning this information off, if you're doing this on a constant daily basis, you can find this quite tiring and going through these things and getting this information and copying it into various data sources, whether this might be tickets or passing the information to somebody else. And if you spend a number of days doing this, if you're on a large network estate looking for the versions or looking for SNMP or looking for the alignment of NTP to make sure you've got all the right servers or even all the right users across your devices, you can be going through things and it can be quite tiresome and you can sometimes come away from your job feeling that you actually haven't achieved anything that day. And we want to move away from those kind of things. And so these are the tasks that we really want to solve. We want to simplify our operations to gain speed, agility and efficiency. We want to be able to produce quality information, accurate information to, to the people requesting it. And this goes into the delivery, delivery and relevance of customized services that address our consumer needs. And you might think to yourself, well, I'm the network engineer for a, a company. We don't have customers. This is an internal network. But the customers to you, as was reminded to me a number of years ago, are other teams, teams like SRE teams, architecture teams, security teams, managers. They are your consumers. They are your customers. So even though they're not external to your business, they are still your customers and they still need that information delivered reason on a reasonable time scale and they need it to be accurate. The final thing we need to do is support tremendous scale and resiliency. When I started my network journey um, as a network engineer, we probably had around 200 and 250 customers scattered around the, the United Kingdom. When I moved into my next job, that scattered around into being sort of like about 5,000 sites across the United Kingdom. The next job I went into turned into 10,000 customers and users because I've been around the 50,000 mark, which meant loads more routers and loads more switches. And we need to be able to support those in the same manner that we would be able to support the smaller networks with the same sort of speed and the same sort of efficiency. But doing this manually, as we know, is a very challenging, uh, challenging thing to do. So let's look at why some of them. Some of the reasons why we need to start automating our daily tasks, the daily tasks that come through our ticket queues, the daily tasks which get asked of us by a tap on the shoulder and email. When I spoke in that first slide about the tasks that you may find in the boring and repetitive stuff, as an en engineer, this could be a wastage of your skills and resources. There could be something that you could be doing and adding to the business, adding a lot more value to the company and to your team, instead of logging into those devices, constantly checking for information and reporting it back. As valuable as that is, there are other things that have a higher priority to that. And as administrators, we spend a lot of time doing the configuration changes. Once those changes have taken place, somebody needs to validate them. If you're in a position of a team lead or a tech lead, or you have a team of engineers reporting to you, or you've subbed that task out to some other engineers to achieve that task for you, you might want to go into that, those things and actually check to see how that project's doing, to see how it's aligning with your business needs, and you need, might need to do some validation. But again, we don't want to be logging into the devices constantly to do that. A lot of the times in operation, troubleshooting is the face of outages and it becomes monumental. I've dealt with network outages at such global scale where we lost all of our provider links globally within seconds. If it hadn't been for having redundancy and other links with other service providers, we would have been looking at a total wipeout. Our AS would have disappeared off the map and all of our prefixes disappeared. And we don't want that to happen. So when we're troubleshooting in the in outage situations, 
it's always great to have those things there ready to go for that moment when it might happen and you're there looking for what the root cause is. Again, logging into the devices might not be the best way to actually achieve that. Yeah, I agree. There are times when you have to dig into the line cards and you have to go really deep into the weeds to actually get that information out for you because it might be something to do with an RMA where you're sending the device back or you might be looking at a uh, software default or something which is black holing or hairpinning your traffic in a way that you don't want it to do. But for quick checks and getting all the sort of the low hanging fruit and the basic checks out of the door, troubleshooting quite quickly with automation becomes a, a really good way of getting that information back. So you can start checking things off that checklist that you don't, uh, don't think the issue is. There is also no provision to monitor unauthorized changes and security compliance. This is a great thing that when we start to look at automation, we want to know who's making the changes as well across the board, especially if you're pushing changes out. And you can also do that with validation of your, with your automation to see who's making the changes out there. We have great features like chat ops and obviously AAA logging to see who's making the changes. But it's really good to see who's actually doing that and checking the security and compliance around all of these things. If you're working in a global scale team or there's 10, 20 different engineers and you're all making changes. It becomes very difficult to keep track of all of those configuration changes. We like to baseline all of our configurations so anything that is of the norm sticks out kind of like a sore thumb straight away and we're able to spot it. But this is quite difficult on the human eye, especially if you're looking at say 2000 lines of CLI or you know huge volumes of ACLs or you know large changes, large BGP configurations or something like that. You want to be able to see those changes and you want to be eyeball those changes and be able to make and determine what was causing the problem or what changes took place because you might be one looking to roll those back. Centralized reporting has become such a huge part of our toolkit now. We keep a lot of our configuration in source control and we like to treat our, our network configurations as code now. And having that centralized reporting and being able to monitor and check everything, the changes that were rolled out through source control are another great way to keep, uh, keep an eye on what's going on through your operational tasks, especially if you're using that source control to deploy your changes. In the last bit here, I'm not saying let's point the finger here, because at the end of the day, the whole team is responsible for the uptime and the maintenance of the network. But we need to always be accountable for our actions and the things that we take across our, uh, our, our network, especially in an operational situation. We mentioned a couple of things above there about the provisioning and the un unnecessary, or sorry, the, uh, the ability not to be able to sort of track configuration changes, especially in a fast paced movement and the centralized reporting really helps in here. But really we need to know the accountability of the actions that were taken to be able to revert those changes and get us back into a, a more stable environment. The tasks we are going to solve. I mentioned a little bit before about treating our network infrastructure as code. And this enables us now to treat our network configurations just like software code. And there's different formats to keep these in. You can keep them in Ginger templates or you can keep them in Ansible playbooks. But as new configurations get developed and deployed with modern techniques, this allows we need to have a, more of the version control, the automated testing, simulation testing and a peer review process. I've always worked in environments which are quite stringent on things like RFCs and change control windows where you scheduled that time to make the change and then the change was made. But often in those situations the change can be made but the knock on effect might not be seen for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, even an hour later. In some situations it's been a clear 24 hours when that change has taken place when customers have started to notice abnormalities in their traffic and things or packet loss or something like that. This needs to be all tested. Having the network as code, having it in the control system enables us quickly to identify when that change was made and how to roll that back quite quickly. The self-servicing monitoring aspect is the network automation the continuous self-monitors and pre-selects key performance indicators related to our service or network and notifies of any breach or change. 
when we're pushing out the changes and when we're validating the changes, we want to be made aware of these changes that are taking place. And again, we need to always go back and look at the source control if, if something goes wrong along those lines. But we're able to use automation to quickly validate the changes that were made. And this becomes really key to being able to deliver that business success that we look for today. The final piece here is event-based management, which correlates current events with similar events. So let's take, for instance, that you've got a switch and it up can, upstream connects into two routers on a, on a diverse link and you lose one of those links. Well, you know the link's gone down, but then you'll start getting links for protocols going down. Now, depending on how your monitoring works and what you're using for monitoring, one might trigger before the forehand. So you might get a BGP alert before you actually get a link down. And if you think about all of the services which are running over those links, like applications and hosting and all of those things, they will all alert as well. So what we look to do is we look to correlate all of those links so that if that link does go down, we then look at the, sum the similar things which have created that domino effect to create the multitude of alerts which are now hitting us. So we only need to really need to know the most important thing. And for here, in this case, the example that I've given would be the physical link. We know if the physical link goes down, our BGP peering over that link is likely to go down as well, right? When I started doing network operations and then started to look into that network automation space, this was one of the things that was actually shown to me. And this is a very exact picture that was kind of thrown around in the, uh, the Teams chat channel that was given to me. There was, are you too busy to improve? It had a slightly different spin on things where it said, um, are you too busy to automate? And in the same situation, people were saying, no, I'm too busy to automate. Which is why if you're going to start automating your operations procedures, there comes a point where you have to kind of stop. Stop. And as we talked about in the beginning slide, look at the environment that you're trying to automate. And if you really are that busy, you will see that the benefits of automation will really outweigh the, stop, the slight pause that you have to take to get that operation and, and the skills and the code up to scratch to make the business align a bit more smoothly. Once those things are in place, you can then constantly improve on your automation um, checks, your automation scripts to be able to deliver that. And then you're left with a bit more free time to keep developing all of those things. We talk about the time consuming things, the repetitive configuration things. So I asked right at the start of the, the slide, um, how long or how many times would you would do something for it to be automated? I highlighted two. Two was my general rule of thumb. If I was doing something more than twice and it was coming on to more than twice, I wanted to automate it. And you can run the automation enough times to spread out the cost of creating the automation capabilities. When I talked about the business case in the previous slide, this became, you know, being too busy, constantly firefighting and things like that, constantly having to do the checking and things for other teams. If you can build the automation around that and break down those silos, you're going to make sense of the automation. It's going to become a really, really great business case. So, for example, if I'm going to do this task X times in the next year, will it take me a couple of hours of writing, testing and updating a script to add to my bag of tools? I was reading that thing when I said about the 90 second rule earlier, where if it took somebody 90 seconds, they'd slowly automate it. And I had a look through that person's code repo and it was quite good of what the things that they'd automated through there for some of the things that they saw as their repetitive tasks. Your repetitive tasks are my repetitive tasks will always vary. All of those things will differ from business case to business case, but there will be some kind of similar vein in there where other teams are trying to achieve the same things that you are, or they want that same information. And so by collaborating with other teams to find out what that low hanging fruit is to what the uh, development and testing and the ongoing maintenance code is that you can write, you can really cut down on the amount of time that you're, you're spend doing, doing that hand to hand combat fighting. Each automated execution has a lower cost than performing the work manually. Well, this is true. When I mentioned before about one time when it took me three days to get all the information that I was being requested for, that was actually true. Now, if you think about the amount of time that it would have taken me to do that based upon how much I was being paid per hour and that it took me three days to do that, 
If I was able to build that script out in automation, I could re dramatically reduce the overall overhead and cost that the business was going to take for me to actually run those scripts. If I can get the script and get the information back in a matter of minutes or even an hour perhaps, the cost saving there becomes invaluable. And this is what we call the anti-pattern, that every time we run the automation, you end up spending more time tweaking things because of the environment or process keeps changing. So you constantly have to adapt those things. And we're going to look at those little things a little bit later when we come to the demo of how we can adapt there. We talked about the aspects again, about moving our workflows into there. And the graph on the right hand side kind of sum up, summarizes for me the post check, pre check, execute. If any issues were encountered, we roll back. And that's always something that I'm really passionate about is having that rollback in place. The rollback really only comes into place once you've done your validation and you want to pinpoint that the actual change you made was the actual root cause. I'm sure you've all been in a situation where you've made a change and then an hour later some outage has gone ahead and then you thought to yourself, was it me who actually caused the outage? You might have had pressure to even roll that change back that you made. And then you had to prove that it wasn't the change that you made that caused the outage. And by using automation here and to, uh, to validate our checks through automation, we can be confident that the change we made hasn't caused the outage. So this leads us into the change in network device configuration, the change in services configuration, and then finally the maintenance window work of orders. This all plays the key part of the running order that we take when pushing all of our changes out and then validating those changes operationally across the board. It might not necessarily actually be you doing the validation at the end of the day. There was a number of times when I was making changes where I would make the change, but I wouldn't have the methodology to actually be able to test that. From the network perspective, I could see it was working fine. But at application level, the change that I made might not be working so fine. Having automation to be able to do those pieces like the other teams have in our tool belt becomes a key thing to be able to do the change. So if I'm making a change for another team now, I always ask, how are you going to test that change? How are you going to validate the change? Because you could put the change into the workflow, into the ticket, and then the other team might, might be an hour or two hours or even the next day before they validate that. And in that time frame, there's been, is if there's been issues and there's been tickets raised and there's been perhaps latency or packet loss or something or an application has stopped working. So by doing the validation through that with other teams and looking at their workflows as well, you can then truly deploy your changes with confidence and then validate them knowing all for a while that the changes you're going to make aren't going to cause you an outage. Now we're going to move into the really fun part and this is the demo time. So the demo that I want to present to you today uh, is working through some of those network changes and how we actually how we actually achieve those. And what I'm going to walk through here is, is how I actually built those. Um, let me give you the uh, topology first of all. Let me just bring up my terminal. So you'll see how I'm using um, the DevNet Sandbox. I do a lot of my testing, a lot of my development and nearly all of my demos now in the DevNet Sandbox. I'm using the multi-node uh, uh, viral instance here. And I have three devices and you'll see that there are uh, CSR 1000 Vs. And I've simulated a customer environment with two upstream peering um, devices there. Let's say service provider one and service provider two. And I want to start pulling information back from those devices. And how am I going to do that? How am I going to start bringing things back? Well, in this instance for this demo today, I decided that I'd like to um, try and use RESTConf. When I'm testing RESTConf and I'm getting familiar with something, I always put it into Postman. And Postman is a really great way to sort of the, test the URLs and to make sure that you're going to turn the data back. So you'll hear that you'll see that I'm going to hit one of my devices. I just need to update my IP address to 68. Um, oops. There we go. And I can send this request off to my device and then hopefully see the information come back. There we go. So as the information comes back here, I'm pulling basically all of the device information back from this router. And this will look fairly familiar to you. Can I just make that a little bit smaller? There you go. 
it pulls back the host name, the secret password, the username, VRF, IP address, domain, some of the routes. Um, I've got some IP SLA running on here. We're not using IPv6. We pull them down into our information information. And this is fairly verbose. And when I'm using RESTConf, I tend to stick to the vendor uh, base RESTConf. You can use I, um, IETF or you can use the um, uh, open standards one as well. But I tend to stick with the, the, the Cisco vendor ones, but that's just my personal preference. So I know that this RESTConf call is actually working now and I wanna change this and put this into code. So how do I do that? Let me just move into my um, Atom device go into my Atom and you'll see this is the code that I'm using. I'm just going to scoot up here for the top. So first of all, I'm importing requests and requests, if you haven't used it, is the HTTP library to Python, which is safe for human consumption, kind of like the uh, non-GMO HTTP library. And this is the standard for making HTTP requests with Python and it does a whole lot for us. So anytime I'm doing HTTP requests, I'm importing uh, the request library. When we move down a little bit further, you'll see that I've got the host here from the IP address um, from the other device, which means I'm going to be hitting the CE1 router. I have my port. I'm using the default RESTConf port of 443 and my username of um, Cisco and my password is Cisco. If I slide down just a little bit more into the config, into this function here, you will see that this is exactly the same and I'll highlight this. Mm -hmm. This is exactly the same um, RESTConf call that I was using in Postman, but now I've moved it into Python. So this is really cool. I've moved it from Py uh, sorry, Postman into the, into the um, Python script. As we move through the code here in the main function then, I print out the information that I want. What I've found it with this particular sort of um, uh, vendor RESTConf call is that it can be quite verbose and we need to trim this down. We need to filter this down because it's going to print out a whole bunch of stuff which is quite difficult to navigate through and see as it prints it away. So I'm now going to print out the parts that I want. I want to print out just the host name and the version and I'm going to put them into a little table with um, tabulate. Tabulate is a really nice additional Python library if you want to put things in a table format. So if I jump back over to my uh, my bash script here and then I'm just going to run that same script and we see we pull back the information here, we pull back the host and then we pull back the version and this is great, I can hand this script off to whoever might need it, whoever might want wants to check it but let's say for example that I wanted to check one of my other devices if I hop back into here you'll see that I was hitting the uh, device CE1, which had an ending IP address in 68. Now I'm going to have to go back into my script if I want to retrieve the information back for PE1 and change this to 69. So I'll scoot up here, I'll change this to 69, I'll save that, run back over here and run the script again. Now we see that our host name has changed and we're running the same version. So this is great. We can see that our host name or our host CE1 and PE1 are running the same code version, which is what we want. I've only got three devices here, but going back into this code and changing the IP address is going to get quite tiresome time after time. Now I've written some other scripts which do the same sort of thing. If I look at these, these are ls, I'm just going to grep these out as get. I've got one which will get my BGP information, my device information, which we saw, and my interface. So just for clarity, I'll run the BGP one now as well. And we'll see the information that we get back here. Cool. So we've gone back over now and we're hitting CE1 again. And we can see that this has two upstream neighbors, as we saw in the other viral file. We have the neighbor for what will be PE1 and PE2. And again, I'm passing the information. So how did I get this information? We go back over to our Python script again. Exactly the same, importing requests, I'm importing tabulate. 
I specified again the IP address that I want to hit, the port, the username, the password. But what changes? We go down here and we look under this get BGP function and we see here that I'm pulling back the BGP operation um, state data here. If we go down into the main part of the function, we can now see that I'm actually passing or filtering the link, uptime, the state and the prefixes received. So this is really cool. Now I've sort of granulated that information to make it that little bit more consumable. So it makes it really easy just to check on that router and the state of the devices or the state that my peers are in. I can show you what this would look like if, for example, we weren't passing out all of this information. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to hide all of this and I'm just going to do basically the raw print now of this information. Bearing in mind, this is just one device. If I didn't pass that information, this is all of the details that I would get back. And this is really heavy. You can see here, we're looking at the top, this is a dictionary which we have in the key pairs. And so what I did was to get that information, I took out those key pairs and filtered them so I could get the little table that you see up in the top there. This is why it becomes when we're running these automation scripts to only really show the information that we need. Looking at this information, I think is enough to give anybody a headache. So let's just put our script back to what it was. Okay, this is great. So now we're pulling all this information back and it's looking good. We can give these scripts away to other people, to other teams, other members on our team to get information back about our devices. And this saves the, the tapping of the shoulder, the logging of the tickets, which are coming into us. I'm only showing here, get BGP, get devices, and you'll see that there's another one over here that we're using, um, which is uh, get interfaces. So I've got three scripts. Imagine if I was looking at users, NTP, OSPF, uh, we could be looking at IPSLA, we could be looking at tracking. There's a whole bunch of things that we have configured on our devices these days, like an access list as well. You can imagine how those scripts all of a sudden get a lot bigger. Really, we haven't come too much further away from having run books where people log into the devices, except for we're doing this in a more automated way, in a lot more safer fashion. We're not allowing users now to log into our device. We have this script that they can use to log into the device for us. This is really cool, but these could get really big and they could get really big really, really quickly. We could end up with 20 or 30 different validation scripts. And if it's two o'clock in the morning and you're looking for a validation script, you might be combing through these to actually find the script and actually find the one that you actually want to use. So I've come up with a much better way of doing this. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to open this script up here. This is fairly big script and it did take me a little while to actually write this and this is using called something called OOP which is object oriented programming which is used within Python. It's a programming language which programs are organized around uh, data classes and objects rather than functions and logic and the object can be then used and defined as a data field that has a unique attribute and behavior. So as your scripts get longer and longer, sometimes it makes sense to break them down into these smaller parts where the functions do different things for you or the different scripts do different things for you. You'll see here that what I've started with is writing HTTP, HTTP code straight away. Throughout my bigger scripts and the things that I want to share with others, I generally write a whole bunch of error checking in here as well. So if something's going wrong, with the script or with the call or to the device, you can actually see this within the error checking itself. And you'll see that I'm using HTTP codes. HTTP, HTTP codes are se separated into five different classes. And the first two, uh, the first digits of the status uh, class are the actual response with the last two um, where they don't have any class or categorization to the role itself. But I'm only using, out of the five different roles here, I'm only using three of them that you'll see, the 200, the 400, and the 500. So the 200s I've listed up here, these are the success codes. The um, 
400 codes are our error codes and then the uh, 500 codes, these are our um, server codes. So this would be the destination. So I'm trying to cover all the bases. The ones that I didn't have in here uh, or what I've missed out here is um, the informational one and the other one that I'm missing out here is the one that starts with three, which is the redirection. I don't need those in this code, so I haven't put them in. If I scoot down a little bit further into this code, you'll see here in this function what I'm trying to achieve. I'm actually passing the original URL restconf um, with the data store here in this execute call. If you watched Hank's video uh, on the first, uh, first video for season two, where he talked about having functions and reusing those functions, this execute um, call will serve for the root of all functions which are used throughout this code now. You'll see here what I've actually eliminated from here is the IP address and what would be the port, but in this case we're still using 443. And then I've pulled away um, the rest of the information which you saw in the um, in the restconf call. So for example, I've pulled away um, the Yang model and the container from this because I don't want to hard code those in at just this, this junction. As we go down in this method, you can see I've actually pushed in um, the operations of here, the HTTP operations, the get, patch, and delete, because I want this code to do a lot more for me than just, um, just check data. I want it to also be able to roll back changes and actually push out changes as well. So this code serves as kind of a multi-function check for me to be able to do all of these things. So I have the different methods listed there as well. I'm going to scoot down a little bit quicker. On the previous code, I showed you the get BGP for getting BGP information. And this here on line 140, I'll just highlight that, is that exact Yang model and that container. What's happening here is where you saw in the hierarchical structure of that other function using the uh, rest conf data and pulling in the IP addresses of my device and the port, this now just appends onto the back of that call. I work through that call and I pass through the things that you saw me pass through before. The neighbor ID, the link, the uptime, the state, and the total prefixes. I'm going over that dictionary that you saw, that big reverse dictionary, and I'm uh, filtering or alliterating over that dictionary and pulling out all of that information with a for loop. And that is able to then return that information as I wish to see it. I showed you the get devices, which got our, our, our version name and also, um, oh, sorry, our, dev our device name and our version that we were running. And then the other one that I had in my pane on the left hand side was the get interfaces. And that one's here. And I'll actually run that one once we've got it into the, into the other code so you can see how that works. Great. So let's see that act in action. I just clear my screen. Let's uh, scoot up here. Again, I'm, just for this example, I'm just going to hit um, the uh, device ending in 68, which was CE1. Now I'm going to be prompted for a username and password. And I'll show you why that is in just a second. Great. You'll see this is coming back in a JSON format. You'll find that when using RESTConf on XE devices, you can print this as text and it'll, it'll come back as the JSON device. Because I'm using RESTConf here, um, RESTConf can use both XML and JSON. Um, my personal preference, I prefer RESTConf just because it pushes the information out. It's a little bit faster um, and it's a little bit, um, it's less verbose than XML. So I'm able to pass through that a lot sort of quicker by using JSON. And I find JSON, again, a little bit more sort of friendly on the eye. Okay, really cool. I'm able to get this information back and I'm actually using that code to do that. Again, though, if you look at the, the actual syntax that I typed in here, I had to specify the IP address. And if I wanted to look at another device, I'd have to change the IP address. Now I can get around that in a little bit. But what I want to show you is the actual code which underpins this and how I'm able to pass the IP and this function now to be able to get this information. 
just for clarity, let me just run the BGP one on the same on the same device. Username and password. There we see those two neighbors that we saw before. Okay, this is good. We're getting all the information back and it correlates to what we saw in the single script that I wrote. So let me jump over into this code here. This is the main code. This, this code up here, which is named IOS XC REST API, this is my main code. But how I actually call this code is actually written in this file now called router, um, router py. And so what I do is I actually import that other code, those classes and those functions. I import that uh, Python script into this um, Python file. And you can see from here, I just import that. Now I'm importing a couple of other things here and it's this one, and this is really magic. This is called click. Again, if you saw Hank's, Hank's um, video right at the start thing, he used args pass. And if you're familiar with args pass, click works in a very, very similar way. Um, where you're able to pass commands directly on the command line. You saw when I was doing that little bit of a demo there beforehand that I was actually passing the IP address, but we can pass a whole bunch more of stuff. Um, incidentally, click stands for command line interface creation kit. Um, and it enables you to type the commands in as you see them or have commands in there that are already expected. You can see those starting here at line 15, where I define this click group. And under here, under this click option at line 17, I am specifying that IP address where you saw me put dash dash IP. I don't have to put dash dash IP, but this is just the format that I've become accustomed to working in. So I type this in. I've got a few other things in there as well, but let me show you how the click you can actually interact with those click just on the Python shell before we see how the other options actually work for us. So what I do is I go back to my original code here. I specify the router info, I remove the IP and I've got this built in help function. A little bit earlier, I said, what happens if you woke up in the middle of the night and you didn't know which script to run or where to get that script from? Well here, if you look on the command section down here on the left hand side, you'll see now that I have the BGP, the get interfaces and the get devices. They're all there. And I've got this little description in here, which tells me what to do as well. I also have the options up here. So for example, if I miss something out when I'm actually calling the script, for example, say I miss uh, the IP address out and I just try to run the, the get BGP, it might prompt me for the username as it starts to work through. But what is going to happen is that it's going to crash out and it's not going to actually run the script. Let me just clear some space there so we can see that again. Cool. Okay. So we talked about the IP here and you can put in the help function here which prints the IP DNS of the address and you can customize these and put whatever you want in here. Um, here you'll see file. I'll come to that one just in a second. We've got port. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're using uh, RESTConf using the default uh, 443 port. But there are times where devices run non-standard port where you might be doing some port forwarding or something. And what we want to do is we can change that port and we can specify that by using the, the sort of like the, the double lines and then specifying port and then entering a new port number in there like 9443, for example. But here you'll see I've specified the uh, default. The username and password is a little bit of a nice one. You can actually hard code those in and pass them exactly like I did with the, the 443. But in this instance, I've decided for this to be prompted. I want to know who's logging into my devices and not just using a default, say, admin, admin password. You could tie this back to SSH and not have this function actually in here and people log into their devices with their SSH keys. But in this case, I'm just using asking for the password to be pushed in here. Now comes the magic. And this is the really cool bit. This is the bit that I really, really like about this. And I'm just going to use my get devices as an example. Here in click, we have the main dot command. And we run this using the get devices. And that is the get devices to actually initiate the actual call that we want to make to our devices. We pass this as an object. 
and then we refer to the function that we saw in the um, uh, the original the big piece of code here that function and that will actually call the function from the previous piece of code that we saw uh, this piece of code here I'll just jump to it and it would be uh, get devices it's going to run this function now remember that this is also hierarchical as well so our root underscore info python file goes from running there in click and goes back into this particular python file and then goes and takes the um, data store in the container and then goes all the way up to the top here to actually run the rest conf call so if i go back over to this and scoot down to get devices we go through the for loop there, and in that for loop, we get the devices. And this becomes a little bit more complicated when we want to do one or two devices. And this is what I was talking about when I specified the file. When we was looking at our other scripts, we were going in and changing the IP addresses. And when you saw me run the uh, get BGP using this object oriented Python, uh, Python program, you then saw me hard code the IP addresses in there as well. But let's say, for example, we want to make that a lot more dynamic. And also, we want to retrieve information from a whole bunch of devices, not just one device. And we want to do this at one time. Can we do this with our program here? Yes, we can. If I scoot back up here to this file that was running, oops, slide over here, you'll see that I give the option for a file. Now here by doing that file, if we go down just a little bit further, I'm actually opening a file here. So I'm saying in my main function here, that if I see an IP address run through the program, else we're going to look for uh, a file. And here is that file. Really easy to write, nice and simple in following a JSON format with our three devices. If you're going above, I would say 10 or 20 devices, really you would be going back to make your call from something like a CMDB server, IP blocks, Prime or something like that to pull all the information back from your devices. In this instance, because I only have one router, I'm just using this JSON file. But if you go above that, you want to be pulling your information back from a, a lot more of a reliable source like your, your IP database where you're keeping all the information about your devices. So here, you'll see that I have my three devices. Well, I have my 68, 69, and 70. If we jump back over quickly to my uh, uh, viral instance, you'll see all of my devices. So now I want to run this script. And I want to run it, and I want to get all the information back about my uh, devices, and I want to use that JSON um, file uh, to get all that information back. So I'm just going to specify device again. It's going to prompt me for the username and password. But fortunately, in my case, all of my usernames and passwords are the same. Here, you'll see that I'm going through that list of um, IP addresses, the 68, 69, and 70, that is C1, PE1, and PE2 as well. And I'm able to get all of that information back. Now, I could do whatever I wanted to with this information. I could um, forward this information into an Excel sheet. I could forward it into an email. I could put it into a database somewhere. But this becomes now really powerful is that I'm able to choose my scripts using the um, click function that we saw here, uh, the, the help function. I'm able to use my um, get devices. I'm able to locate the script that I want to use. And I'm able to be able to run this against individual devices or I can run this against a whole host of devices now. Now, this gives me great power to be able to pass these scripts to other people, to use them for myself and be begin my troubleshooting process quite quickly. And talking of troubleshooting, let's use that same file to get BGP information off all three devices at once. Again, we're going to go through those devices and it pulls them back. And that's one of the really nice things I like using about REST Conf is it pulls them back really quickly. So here you can see that we're pulling back off, this would be um, PE2, we're pulling back the neighbor ID of CE1. It's an external link, so we're using eBGP. The uptime, the established, and how many prefix are being set. If something had happened to our BGP sessions, we'd be able to see this right here, right now. We'd see that session as inactive, or we'd see it as down. So we're able to troubleshoot on the fly really quickly with our, our 
our scripts. But it doesn't stop there. As you saw on this, um, as you saw on this root info script, we're pulling all of that in the information back. And I can show you again in the terminal where we had get devices, get BGP, get interfaces. We could build this out to be so much more bigger and our scripts would then begin to evolve, but we're only using one script. That one script is able to get all of this information back for all of these different circumstances. So I've identified the three things that I get asked the most. Are these BGP neighbors up and functioning and passing and receiving the right prefixes? Yes. Are my devices running the same version? Yes. I can even go a bit more verbose and look at all the um, uh, interface information to check my IP addresses, errors received and things like that on my interfaces. But that ends up being quite a big sort of output and I didn't want to show that today. But it's all in the script if you should want to use it. So that, should, that kind of concludes the demo side here. That was quite a big demo. So I want to summarize. What did we talk about? We talked about who moved my cheese and learning the services and getting context, finding the biggest sources of stress, the things that kind of the low hanging fruit, the things that we're constantly being asked by other teams. And I want to get those other teams to start using automation to find the things that they want to find out about our network, about the tasks that they want to do. It's far quicker to build a script for somebody and have them run that script than somebody to log a ticket and that information to go around in a circle for 24 and 48 hours. Break down those silos, find out what information other teams are requesting and help orchestrate and write those scripts to help them do their jobs better. We talked about the rinse and repeat and when is too much. And again, a great question. I really love your feedback here is how many times would you consider doing something before you wrote automation? Back in the day, I'm going to say that I was actually really, really stubborn. And I would go over those tasks a few times until one day somebody said to me, why are you doing this manually? It's so much more easier to begin automating. After I started automating, I was sold. And so I started automating all of my boring stuff. We did the demo here and the demo was quite big. So I appreciate you hanging in there with me was looking at some really great technology of click and OOP. We looked at the request library, HTTP and um, RESTConf as well. And we walked through that entire process of building that code in Postman, looking at the RESTConf calls, transferring that into the single script and then building it out to something a lot bigger, something that can be deployed across multiple devices and can be shared amongst different teams and becomes expandable so that when your network automation skills get bigger and people ask you to build in different functions and different features and different checks, you're only updating one piece of code. You're not reinventing the wheel and rebuilding code all the time. You're just modifying and updating that script. And it's great to say to people on your team, we've updated this script and now you can see these things and this is the things that you'll see via this script. We've added more information for you to be able to codify your day job better. As mentioned at the top of the hour, we publish all of the code and things for on this that you can find. And here's some great webinar resources and links that you can go through, which will start you off on your RESTConf journey and using Python. I've got a link in there to the multi uh, iOS viral sandbox, which I use today, which is free for all you guys to use with your DevNet account. And the code samples you can find on my repo right there, right at the bottom. If you're looking for more about DevNet DevOps, hit up this slide with a whole bunch of great links for you to um, find all the information that we're talking about in the Net DevOps series and the video links here and the, you'll be able to get the PDF and all the resources for, your, for yourselves on all of these links here. So then this is where I like to issue a little challenge right at the end of the thing. If this is your first time seeing Click for the first time, have a go with this. The Click documentation is really, really cool. And so an example of this is for printing text, building standard options, which will take a string as an input. You saw me there pass a username and password and IP in there as well. You, you can use Click to pass those things to the command line. And that's a great way to get you started by using Click. Click can be quite expansive and it can do many things for you to help make your day job easier and using your automation scripts as well. Once you've built those, please put them on code exchange. If you've got more questions, please stay in touch. I'm reachable for all the content that you've seen today on all of the de details on the left hand side. You can follow me on Twitter Hub, uh, sorry, Twitter Hub? 
Twitter or you can follow me on GitHub where you'll see all the code that I've used today. All the resources that we've used today are also on Cisco DevNet and you'll see me there sailing into my boat. And with that, I'll bid you farewell and sail off into my boat into the sunset. Great. Thanks so much for an awesome webinar, Stuart. The example, um, you apologize for the demo. I don't think that apology was necessary in the slightest. What was awesome about it was kind of seeing the process that you build and how it took it all the way to the end to making it a usable tool you can share with the rest of the team. And so I think everybody got value out of it. We had lots of comments and questions coming on looking for interest in the code. And as mentioned, it is available up on Code Exchange and GitHub for folks to take a look at. So with that, we're going to go ahead and close down. Thank you again to Stuart for joining us today, and thank you to all for joining us live. We'll be back next week for another episode of NetDevOps Live. Talk to you soon.